Hello and welcome to the fifth video from the Friends of the Wendon Road Cemetery in association with the Blake Museum. Today we'll be focusing on just one part of the Anglican half of the Wendon Road Cemetery, the Paupers Burial Ground. Who were the paupers? Well, they were just ordinary people, simply anyone too poor to afford the cost of their own burial. As these were the days before cremation, every single person who died had to be buried. Burial had to be paid for by someone, so if an individual or family couldn't afford the money for a plot, then the dead were buried at the expense of the parish, and by default in the parish burial ground, i.e. the Church of England burial ground. The original Anglican side of the cemetery was split into four priced sections. Section A was the most exclusive and nearest to the chapel. Section 4 was the next most prestigious, then Section 3, Section 2, and finally Section 1 which was divided between Section 1B, the cheapest plots that could be purchased, then Section 1A, assigned for the paupers. The whole area is now open. We used to think that memorials were banned in these sections, and that for the paupers in the middle, this was the case. However, there were once memorials on the sides of the paid sections, although for some reason these were cleared. In the winter of 2015-2016, the Friends volunteers were clearing away scrub in advance of planting a new hedgerow, during which they stumbled upon memorial after memorial, all toppled and discarded in the hedge. Most of these photos are by Andy Slocum, by the way. These memorials were presumably toppled by the council at some point, although when and why this was comprehensively done in this area is forgotten. It's a huge shame here, considering how these poor families must scrape together what little money they could to afford their own plots, and then enough money for a humble memorial stone. This is a sad injustice. Anyway, the volunteers spent months digging each memorial out, recording it, and then rolling it out to a safer location. The friends then planted a new hedge of native species of hawthorn, field maple, hazel, blackthorn, and dogwood, and then rolled all the memorials back again so they wouldn't end up victim to the council mower. This picture shows how the hedge has grown in, and this was taken at the end of 2019. Anyway, returning to the paupers section in the middle. As we learnt last week, the Anglican side of the cemetery was consecrated by the Bishop of Jamaica on the 10th of September 1851. The very next day, the very first burial took place, and this was for a pauper called Amelia Bennett, who was aged 15 and noted as the daughter of Anne Bennett of Mount Street. For the first couple of years, the person in St Mary's Church who kept the register even included the cause of death. So we learn that Amelia died of consumption, known as tuberculosis or TB today. Unfortunately, the precise location of her burial was not recorded. There is only a note saying border, although this is almost certainly a pauper burial in this section. We find a few scraps of information of Amelia's short life in the records. She was baptised in St Mary's Church on the 4th of May 1836. Only her mother Anne's name is, is recorded in the register. There was no father mentioned, and for the box marked for the parents' quality, trade or profession, all it says is single woman. Amelia was thus an illegitimate child, which carried a great amount of social stigma at the time. We learn from later records that Anne was only 19 years old when she had Amelia. Anne is recorded on the 1841 census living in Honeysuckle Alley, which ran between what is now Clare Street and Market Street, living with William Bennett, a 65-year-old tallow chandler or candle maker, his wife Maria, then 39-year-old William, a butcher, 27-year-old Thomas, a tailor, and then there was 23-year-old Anne. However, four-year-old Amelia isn't noted as living with them, suggesting that she was being raised elsewhere. Where, though, is a mystery. We do find Amelia ten years later on the 1851 census, the same year that she would die. She was living in Clare Street, uh, called Back Street then, and was a lodger in the home of William Bennett, 49-year-old widower, and candle maker. This is presumably Amelia's uncle, the butcher mentioned in 1851. Also living there was Thomas Bennett, 37 year old tailor, the other uncle. One suspects that Amelia would have been the housekeeper and cook for the two men. I've not been able to trace Amelia's mother Anne for the 1851 census though, so where she was is a mystery. All in all, Amelia's short life is otherwise lost to history. And these sort of vague lives are stories that recur again and again in the records of the paupers area. The second burial in the register comes 12 days later, on the 23rd of September 1851. This was Sir John Biffin of West Street, aged 56, who died of inflammation of the bowels. He was buried in a plot called E51. Helen Brightchard, a long-time supporter of the Friends, a retired nurse, suggests that inflammation of the bowels could refer to several conditions, such as Crohn's disease, ulcerated coliitis, or as a result of an epidemic such as dysentery. Either way, it would have been a very unpleasant way to die. 
Over the coming days and weeks, we can find a number of burials buried in the same plot on top of Mr. Biffin. That same day was also buried Thomas Baker of Albridge Street, aged 32, his cause of death being inflammation of the lungs. This is probably a form of bronchitis. On 27 September, Francis Hill of Pig Cross, which is Pennell or you now, aged 92, his cause of death recorded as decay of nature. On 8th of October, James Swan of Angel Crescent, aged 58, was buried, his death, inflammation of the kidneys. 14th of October, Charles Hoyle of Mount Street, 42 years, cause of death, inflammation of the liver. Then to top off the grave came two babies. On 15th of October, Sarah Ann Hatch, daughter of Ellen Hatch, came from the Union Workhouse, aged just two months. And finally, the same day, Henry James Martin, son of James and Harriet Martin of St Mary Street, aged eight months, was buried. Cause of death unknown. Before this large plot was closed, a second one had been opened nearby, F50. Buried here on 20th of October was Thomas Palmer, son of John and Harriet Palmer of Albert Street, aged 17 years, cause of death, consumption or tuberculosis. On the 25th of October, Robert Barnard of West Street, aged 70, was buried, cause of death, dropsy. On the 31st of October, Samuel Bryant, no address given. He was 17 year old as well, and he was accidentally drowned in the River Parrot. And we find several instances over the years in the cemetery of people dying this way. And with so much traffic on the Parrot, fatal accidents were an occupational hazard. On 3rd of November, Sarah Ann Cotton, daughter of Mary Cotton of the Union Workhouse, aged two months, was buried, another illegitimate child. On the 29th of November, Charles Hembry, baby son of George and Maria Hembry of Albert Street, aged 18 months, died of measles. On the 12th of December, John Brown, baby son of William and Caroline Brown of West Street, died, aged one year, cause of death, consumption or tuberculosis. On the 15th of December, Julia Bennett, daughter of Selina Bennett of West Street, died two months. Cause of death, inflammation of the lungs. Then on 22nd December, Samuel Socrates Story, son of William and Jane Story of Albert Street, aged three months, died of measles. And finally on Christmas Eve was buried John Singleton of St Mary Street, aged 70 years, cause of death, asthma. There was a total of 21 burials for the whole cemetery in the last few months of 1851. Five of these had their own individual graves. The other 16 were split between these two large communal plots in the pauper section. And this is a sort of pattern of use we find in the cemetery thereafter. By far, most of the burials end up in the pauper section. Unfortunately, after November 1857, the cause of death was no longer recorded in the burial registers. After December 1868, they also stopped recording the exact place of burial for the paupers, so we have no idea exactly where anyone buried in this area might be or who they are buried with. Even though they were filling up each plot as they went on, once these rows were filled up, they added more rows in between, which they also did throughout the rest of the cemetery as they started running out of space, and they even added extra plots onto the ends of the rows. We know there are probably about 10 rows in the pauper's ground in total, and that each row contained about 50 plots, up to about 55 plots during into the paths. That's 550 plots in total, roughly. If we assume an average of say seven burials per plot then we can assume that there's somewhere around 3850 burials in this small area maybe more maybe less for the least marked part of the cemetery it contains by a country mile the highest density of burials for the whole site to rectify this lack of memorialization the friends of the cemetery were kindly donated a memorial stone by the cooperative funeral care of bridgewater a few years ago this gives descendants of those buried there somewhere they can honour the dead. The stone also makes mention of the bones of the charnel house of St Mary's, which were apparently taken here once that was finally cleared out after St Mary's was closed for burial in 1854. When this area was used up, they added more discrete plots to extensions in the rest of the cemetery for these pauper burials. But by that time, the Bristol Road Cemetery had also opened, allowing further use up there. Later still, Cremation came into fashion, which alleviated the need for burial ground. You may have already noticed the sort of places where these paupers were coming from. The poorer parts of the town, West Street especially, and that sort of area. But we've also seen mention of the workhouse. We're incredibly lucky in Britain today. There's a rightful recompense for the unimaginable bloody sacrifices the people made in the Second World War. We now have a welfare state, founded on five principles of adequate income for all, access to free healthcare, the right to a good education, adequate housing and full employment. Although it could be said that the government has slid backwards on a few of these since 1946, there is, or should at least, be a safety net for every single person in the country today. 
However, before this was the age of the five giants of want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. For the poor of mid-Victorian Bridgewater, there was no safety net. Little to no housing regulation meant poor families could be packed into overcrowded courts, sharing even the basics of a toilet and a wash house with many other neighbours. Yet even this could be taken away from you. Work was often seasonal, and although the brickyards provided lots of employment for the town, they might lay off most of their staff for part of the year or even during a downturn in trade. When there was nowhere left to turn, the only option left was the workhouse. The guiding principle behind this was that if you were in need of handouts to support yourself as you had no other option, then one, you had to come and live in the workhouse and not stay at home, and two, you would not be idle while you were there. You had to toil to earn your daily bread and for a place to sleep. It was a fairly heartless system and, as we saw back when cholera struck the town, was often the first place where disease outbreaks occurred. The thing to keep in mind when we see workhouse in the cemetery burial records, or union house as it was often referred, is that the Bridgewater Union Workhouse represented a district of 40 parishes, covering from up on the Quantocks to the middle of the Polden Hills, from the mouth of the Parrot to past North Peverton. If we just take the first two months for the workhouse register of deaths for 1867, we can get an idea of the scope of this institution. So, on the 1st of January died Joseph Dudridge of Cannington, aged 72. On the 7th of January died Francis James Webber of Otterhampton, aged 29. On the 11th of January died Charlotte Laddick of Broomfield, aged 67. On 22nd of January died Anne Ashill of Moorlinch, aged 79. On 27th of January died Jemima Crosby of Eddington, aged 84. On 29th January, Charles Pittman of Overy died, aged 82. On 4th February died Hannah Harbury of St Michael Church, aged 86. On the same day died Charlotte Lockyer of Bridgewater, aged 74. On the 9th of February, Walter Weber of Bridgewater died, aged 20. On 15th of February, Mary Ann Court of Wemden died, aged 8. On the 23rd of February died Walter Merrick of Cosington, aged 86. All of these individuals were buried in the paupers area of the Wendon Road Cemetery, all except Charles Pittman of Overy anyway, whose body we learn was taken out by relatives, so presumably went back to his home village. So it's worth bearing in mind that although the Wendon Road Cemetery is physically in Bridgewater, there are hundreds of people buried here from a large area of Somerset. Each village gave up its dead to this small plot of land. We started this talk with a story of someone we know very little about, poor Amelia Bennett of Mount Street. We'll end with someone we know much more about who is also buried in the Pauper's Burial Ground. A friend's honorary archivist, Michelle Craig, while looking for something else in the online newspaper archive, accidentally came across this story in the West Somerset Free Press for 5th of November 1870. A human curiosity. A woman has just died in the Bridgewater Union Workhouse who was exhibited at St Matthew's Fair in that town, and in most towns and cities in England, America and Australia, on account of her having a great profusion of whiskers, beard, etc. She has been twice married, and her son, who was present at her death, has hair hanging halfway down his back. Deceased was a native of Geneva. Annoyingly, this report failed to even mention the name of this poor woman. Having a look through the workhouse register of deaths, we can find her. 29th of October 1870 died Josephine Clophilia of Bridgewater, aged 42, buried in the Bridgewater Cemetery. Uh, she wasn't from Bridgewater, why she was recorded from there is unclear. We can then find her in the burial register of the Wendon Road Cemetery. 2nd November 1870, Josephine Clophilia of Union House, uh, the workhouse, aged 42 years, officiating minister Reverend W.G. Fitzgerald. Just a cursory look on Google revealed this to be Josephine Clophilia, who was an international celebrity and a famous bearded lady. Much of her story has been uncovered by the historian Sean Trainer, and I've added a link to his biography of her in the description below. Born Josephine Boydeschen, and apologies for my pronunciation there, in 1829 in Switzerland, she toured around the world, even being given a diamond by the Emperor Napoleon III in reward for her having adopted his famous beard for a time. She was part of the famous circus of American showman P.T. Barnum, who was the basis of that film, The Greatest Showman, of a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, in that film, they made up a fictional bearded woman instead of using Josephine, although it should have been Josephine, as that was P.T. Barnum's famous bearded lady. But something to note from these online articles is that Josephine's death was a mystery. The Wikipedia article, for example, plucks the year 1875 out of thin air. 
But we now know that while being exhibited at St Matthew's Fair in late September 1870, Josephine caught a severe illness and was forced into the workhouse hospital to recover. After nearly a month, she slipped away, her death certificate stating that the cause of death was a low fever. This certificate also records that Josephine died in the company of another inmate of the workhouse, an elderly widow called Mary White, who could only sign the witness statement with a feeble cross. Josephine, the woman who had performed for kings and emperors and had travelled the world, ended buried in a communal plot, surrounded on all sides, above, below, front, back, both sides, by fellow paupers in this small patch of West Country ground. Incidentally, Mary White, who was beside Josephine at the end, was a Bristolian who was born in 1801 and the widow of a Moses White who had died sometime in the 1850s. After his death, Mary spent the rest of her life in the workhouse. She's there in the 1861 and 1871 censuses, described as a domestic servant, and she died herself there on the 25th of January 1875 to be buried in the pauper section of the cemetery alongside Josephine and the likes of 15 year old Amelia Bennett of Mount Street. And with that we'll finish here for today. As always you can support us in the usual ways, you can join the friends, buy one of our books and until next time please take care.